Well, so DDR is a single-ended interface, right? So with a single-ended interface, you have multiple I.O. switching simultaneously or can happen simultaneously, and that's creating a massive load on your PDN. And so SSO means simultaneous outputs. And when you have all these outputs switching, you're creating SSN, simultaneous switching modes. And when it comes to managing that, that's a huge thing when it comes to signal integrity because all this SSN gets induced into your signals going to the receiver. So at the transmitter, or in this case, the memory controller, any SSO is gonna create SSN and your power integrity goes so far, it also happens within the memory controller. So if it's not managed well on the die, almost nothing you can do. So it's extremely important to success or failure to having good signal integrity. So that's why I say in the last paper I just did, today's signal integrity engineers for anything related to memory need to be signal and power integrity engineers. It's harder today to do uh, modeling than it's ever been. Yeah, so to create a PowerWare uh, SI model, you need to have an end-to-end -end simulator. And there are a few, few tools on the market that do that. I prefer Keysight ADS. That is my preferred solution. I can create an end-to-end -end signal integrity model for DDR4. In fact, I just demonstrated that in the paper I just published where I showed all eight byte lanes running and I had the full PDN, all the extractions, the VRM model, everything, and all connected together from the SDRAMs to the memory controller. So how do I demonstrate that? Well, when you run bits through the channel, you're creating that load on the PDN. And any sort of noise or impedance mismatches in your PDN comes out through the memory controller if it's a write cycle or the DRAM if it's a read cycle. And you see that noise induced as SSN on the signal nets. There's this, um, this is not an easy problem, right? Now, if you're on the ASIC design team, the, the one thing you can do is add more balls on the ASIC dot, right? But that's a trade-off, right? You're an ASIC designer that adds costs. So you have a finite amount of balls you can add on a respective power domain. So I'll give an example. At Northrop, you know, we have a main VDD core rail for an ASIC that we design on a package. There are 3,000 VDD VSS bumps for that power domain. And so if you have not enough inductance, the way to mitigate that is you're adding more bumps on the die. Not everybody has that luxury. And there's a cost associated with that. In the aerospace and defense sector, we have a different stakeholder than others at the commercial side, right? So you're adding cost, but here we care about more mission success. That doesn't always work in the commercial world. On the package side, really uh, you can add additional unpackaged caps, but those only go so far. So sometimes there's a trade-off. If you can't mitigate it on the package and you definitely can't mitigate it on the die side by adding more on die capacitors or increasing your, your bumps to reduce your inductance, right? You're spreading the inductance out over more bumps. There's almost nothing you can do. Your PDN only goes up to, on the board side, up to around 80 to 100 megahertz. That's about the fact that it's a good design. There's been a lot of work done by lots of folks on this. Um, I mean, one of the best things you can do, it starts at the stack. Anytime you do a board design, even on a package design, the first thing you need to consider is what power domains do you have and what are your critical signals? And then make sure you design a stack up very first thing to appropriately manage that. If you don't do that, you're going to be forced into situations and if you're cost constrained, where you're gonna have a stack up that's gonna perform poorly. Having poor ground planes or having too many, any ground plane cuts, that's a known thing, right? Ground plane cuts are very bad. Uh, having not enough ground planes for all your return currents. On the VRM side, making sure your loops are very tight. There's all sorts of things you can do from an inductance perspective where if you're looking at, I've seen where you have VRMs, they don't have, they're not stable and you don't have the right bolt capacitance or uh, feedback capacitance, or you haven't set your poles right in the feedback loop, and now you're switching and creating some sort of transients. Those are other EM line of things. Those are the basics. There are plenty more, but stack up is the fundamental thing where you need to start. It goes back to what we just said, right? It's all about managing your current. If 
If your wave guides for your design are not appropriately managed, you have impedance mismatches or reflections in those channels, you're going to see it. And it's going to come out either as signal loss, EMI, or you're going to have other discontinuities, other problems in the channel. Yeah, I mean, there's some basics here. So in the military world, right, we care about reliability. Um, and the commercial does too, but we, we typically operate you know, just like automotive over a broader temperature range. One of the biggest things you see on a PCB design perspective is we do very dense HDI boards, right? High density interconnect. And that means we have blind, buried, and through beams. And so there's a lamination cycle maximum when you develop these boards. And we're developing boards that go anywhere from 24 layers up to 40 plus layers that are mixed signal digital RF. And that means we have huge density, right? We have parts that are so crammed in there. We have so many signal layers just around everything. And that also means to make those boards work, we're doing, we're a lot, relying a lot more on blind and buried vias than we are on the through. We don't care so much about cost. And when you have all those vias, especially stacked on top of each other, there's a thermal expansion coefficient that you have to consider, right? As that design in its actual operation or mission application, is going through its lifetime, it's gonna experience uh, thermal expansions, right? It's gonna be heated up and cooled down, whether it's in space, on an airplane, doesn't matter. And what's gonna happen is, is the thermal expansion on that copper, you can have failures. And so what we typically do as a very common practice is we stagger those via structures. That's a very common thing to do, but that's something that a lot of people aren't afforded to do. It does add cost. Uh, that depends, right? So typically 10% is what most fabrication houses are designing for. There are critical designs where you can specify more, it just adds costs. Um, I, I think now there are certain folks in the industry that are looking to get well within that 5% range, but 10% is kind of the accepted standard. How, how much is too much? I mean, it depends. What signals are we talking about? How fast are we going? Are we talking about DDR4? Are we talking about PCIe Gen 3, Gen 4? Are we talking about uh, ether, some Ethernet standard, right? 400 gigabit, right? Across how many data pair? That's why it's kind of a loaded answer. Yeah, this comes down to the, the, the CCA or PCBA assembly. Um, if you can support the layout and the cost to integrate these, what it comes down to from a design perspective is after you are able to route these, right, if you're capable of routing, you have a layout team that's capable of doing this. So the fan out is the first problem. The next problem is the manufacturing pitch, right? Most PCB assemblers, the most common right now is 0.8 millimeter pitch. You're getting down in the smaller 0 0.6, 0 0.4, but not everybody has that technology to assemble those sort of BTA pitch patterns. And it's cost, right? <laughs> Typically, the first thing you should do if you're designing a part is you need to make sure the fab house and the assembler that you're working with can support the technology that you want to design to. Those are really the primary limitations. Well, I mean, if you have a transmission line, impedance is based on the root of L over C, right? So there's always a parasitic capacitance within the transmission line. The best way I would do this if I have a board, I have artwork. I will do extractions of that artwork for that transmission line. From that, I know if there's too much inductive or capacitive. And this is very simple. You can take that extracted model and you can run a TDR on it. If you don't have any EM extraction and you actually have raw artwork, you can make a measurement with a TDR. And this is very simple, right? Um, with a TDR, you have impedance. And you you start off with the voltage and you convert that into heat. And anything that's positive going, like a positive going blip on that transmission line is inductance. Anything that's negative going is capacitance. And so you can integrate across that inductance by uh, places of simple cursors and then you know how much inductance or capacitance is precisely on that transmission line. Yeah, so it starts off with reliability. Um, has it flown before? Right? Has it been deployed into space or on an airplane? Is it something that we've used before? What's the risk if we have it? Rad hard. Rad hard versus rad tall. Those are very different. What's its lifetime? 
what application? Are we talking about a LEO application or a GEO? Those are very different pieces in orbit, and those have different radiation requirements. Uh, what sort of failure are we accepted? Are we allowed to have? Is it Class B or Class A? Those have very different requirements from a lifetime requirement. Those are the typical basic starting points. There are a lot more, but that's a simple start. Oh, sure. I mean, power integrity is, can, everything from electronics today is contingent on power integrity today. It determines the success or failure of all electronic products today. If you think about it, what we're doing is we're making a system, and that system is a transmission line, and it's a transmission line for that power. If that transmission line is matched appropriately to the source, to the load, your power is going to be delivered appropriately. If it's not, you're going to have problems. There are lots of other definitions on power integrity, but what lots of folks agree on is that power integrity is really all about the quality of noise seen by the circuits on the dot. If that noise is greater than a certain amount, you're going to have problems.